The Large Hadron Collider is the largest and most powerful atom smasher in the world. Built to hunt for new particles and probe the fundamental forces of nature, this massive machine is a 27-kilometer underground loop filled with supercooled magnets and massive detectors that whip particles at the highest speeds possible to eventually collide into each other. And during one famous sprint in 2012, particles collided and the Higgs boson was officially discovered. I would like to add my congratulations to everybody involved in this tremendous achievement. The Higgs is a special particle. Its presence confirmed the existence of an invisible quantum field that's responsible for giving particles their mass. This field permeates the universe, leading some to suspect that the Higgs may play an important role in the origin of everything. But at this point, the Large Hadron Collider and the community that built it are at a crossroads. Physicists haven't found the supersymmetry particles they were hoping to see. If they did, it would have solved some open mysteries we have about the Higgs and the inner workings of the universe. This has created a huge international debate over what to do next. For many at CERN, the institution that runs the Large Hadron Collider, the next step in the hunt for new physics is to build an even bigger machine. People expected for 40 years before the Higgs was discovered that the Higgs could not be a lonely elementary particle. It would have to come along with a lot of other things in order to give a coherent sort of rational explanation for the origin of its mass. And the big surprise since July 4th, 2012, when the Higgs was uh, triumphantly discovered, is that that has not happened. So that's really sort of four decades of a certain paradigm for what's going on with the physics associated with the Higgs that has not worked out the way theorists imagined that it would. And that's, that's kind of fascinating. I think uh, the last time something of this degree of surprise happened to theoretical physics was probably a little over 100 years ago. What nature has in mind for what the Higgs is about is something different than what theorists had in mind. While theorists are very confused about it, the program for experimentalists is completely clear. When you run into a kind of elementary particle you've never seen before, you've never seen anything like it anywhere in physics before, you just put the damn thing under a microscope and you study it to death. It's pretty remarkable that we need to build enormous machines that produce an incredible amount of energy to probe the smallest things in the universe. And the push towards higher collision energies to discover new particles is connected to Albert Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. There's an equivalence here between energy on one side and mass on the other side. When we collide two particles, we gain access to the kinetic energy they carry. And out of this kinetic energy, new particles can be made according to Einstein's relation. And of course, the higher the energy that we bring into this collision, the higher the mass of a particle that is forming out of this energy can be. To get more juice out of the machine, CERN shut the LHC down for performance upgrades. They're working on cranking up the luminosity. Luminosity is a measure for the quality of a collider. And in some sense, it tells you how many collisions per second this collider can provide. When two of the elementary particles have kind of a head-on collision, and you can tell that that happened because the, the results of the collisions uh, come out at larger angles relative to the beams, but it's still an incredibly messy and kind of complicated environment. And even when we produce new elementary particles, like the Higgs, they don't come out wearing a name tag saying, I am a Higgs. They, they decay in a blink of an eye. It's the results of those uh, decays that then our experimental colleagues have to sort of sift through, like uh, looking for a needle in a haystack in order to actually see the evidence this luminosity upgrade would ultimately produce more collisions and would make measurements of particles like the Higgs even more accurate. Once completed in 2026, it'll produce an estimated 15 million Higgs per year, compared to the 3 million in 2017. It will be very beneficial to operate this infrastructure until about 2035 or 2040. And by then, we will have collected such a huge amount of data from the collisions that we somehow saturate the knowledge that can be provided by this machine. Operating it five years longer or 10 years longer will not give significantly more information, which means for particle physicists that the useful time of life of this accelerator will be reached. 
These timescales seem way out in the future, but to put this in perspective, planning for the Large Hadron Collider began back in the 1980s, construction was approved in 1994, and the first runs didn't start until 2008. So to prepare for what comes next, teams are delivering conceptual designs for next-generation particle machines. There are proposals for an international linear collider, which Japan just backed out on, China has a circular collider project, and there's one from CERN. I'm in charge of the future circular collider study. What we were working on is not an upgrade of the LHC machine, it's really new machines to come after the LHC era, so from 2040 onwards. It'll take international collaboration, billions of dollars, and scientists to invent tools that don't even exist yet. First things first, though, CERN wants a bigger tunnel. Well, on a map, you can imagine you have a circle, which is the LHC, and then you would put a new circle that is roughly four times larger. The whole existing CERN accelerator complex, including the LHC, would serve as a pre-accelerator for such a future 100-kilometer machine, like the gearbox in a car. You know, you, if you want to drive very fast, you must have several gears. You start in a small gear at low velocity, and once you accelerate, you go to the second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear. This thing is very similar. We would start with small accelerators at low energy, and then we go larger, 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 and higher energy, higher energy, higher energy. The CERN study presents a path forward to achieve these energy gear shifts. There's a new lepton collider, which collides electrons and positrons, a more advanced hadron collider, which collides protons and protons, and then heavy ions, and then a third option, an electron-proton collider. The big difference between an electron and the proton, which are the two particles that, that we have for, the, for these colliders, is essentially that the electron and its antiparticle, the positron, are point-like particles that, to our present knowledge, have no substructure. When we say that the electron looks point-like, but the proton does not, it actually means if you bounce things off the electron, you see that the way photons bounce off of it are just as if the electron had no substructure of any sort. Who knows? If we imagine probing things with microscopes that are a million times stronger than anything that we've seen in some alien civilization that's a million times stronger than the LHD, maybe we would see substructure to the electron too. Okay? Or if you believe string theorists, if we look at ridiculously short distances, everything is made out of some little loop of string. So in what sense are things elementary or composite? But that's a story for another day. The Higgs is kind of point-like, and that's just not good enough for us to sort of really settle this theoretically dramatic question. We can try to measure all the known particles, like the Higgs particle, the W and the Z particle, and the top quark with the best precision possible. And for this, you would build this lepton collider, because the lepton collider could produce exactly these particles in a very clean environment, in huge numbers. The electrons are super clean for collisions, but we cannot reach extremely high energies. The protons are a bit more dirty in the collision, but we can accelerate them to far, far higher energies. Unlike the electron, a proton is not an elementary particle. The uh, proton is a kind of a big, messy object that's made up out of these uh, smaller, as far as we can tell, fundamental constituents known as quarks that are held together inside the uh, proton by the imaginatively named gluon. When we smash protons into each other at incredibly high energies, one set is going this way at 0.9999999, that's seven nines, the speed of light. The other is going the other way, same number of nine times the speed of light. And when they smash into each other, mostly they go splat, and the debris of the collision goes in the direction of the beams that we're coming in. The next generation Hadron Collider would smash protons together like the LHC, except it reach energies of 100 trillion electron volts. The Hadron Collider would provide much higher collision energies that would allow direct creation of today not known particles. This boosted machine could be used as a tool to search for theoretical particles like WIMPs, which are connected to dark matter. It's one of the most abundant and mysterious forms of matter in the universe, and we haven't detected it directly yet. We might be able to, and answer other big questions, by upping the power and tweaking the detector's precision. Factor 100 precision is what we need to decisively settle the question of whether the Higgs looks more point-like than anything we've seen before. 
as far as its probes, how it interacts with other particles. A factor of 10 higher in energy will let us produce billions of Higgs. 100 TV is what we need to settle this question of the simplest possible model of weakly interacting mass of particles. The natural sequence is clearly to start with a Lipton Collider, which is also a machine that is today technically ready for construction. And in parallel to the operation and the, and the physics analysis of this machine, you can use the time to develop the very high field superconducting magnets that you need for the successor machine. The magnets that we have presently operating in the LHC tunnel can only reach eight or nine Tesla, which is the magnetic field strength. So we want to double this to 16 or even higher. Magnets is in this case, the really big challenge for such a project. All these things need to be addressed from the very beginning in small setups, because you do not want to build 15 meter long heavy magnets every time to test something new. While this project is an incredible scientific endeavor, the price tag is very steep. These future colliders could cost over $20 billion and would need investment from the international community to even get off the ground. For this decision process, I mean, there are several aspects, of course. There's a scientific political one, there's an economical one, there's, of course, also a physics community process. And this is exactly what is started now. There's a, a bottom-up opinion-making process, which is taking place in Europe in the, in the coming year. While the discussions continue, some have even questioned whether an investment like this is even the right course forward for the particle physics community. There are questions over whether the science case is as strong, if investing in this project is worth the cost compared to other global issues, and how we can be so sure a machine of this magnitude can answer these big questions. There's a spectrum of possibilities for what could be out there theoretically. And so we, we can't know until we look. Uh, what's definitely true is that no one who's arguing for building these next machines is now saying we should build them because we expect to see particle X. We should build them because uh, supersymmetry is around the corner or extra dimensions around the corner or anything like that. If you believe that the purpose of doing these experiments is making new particles, it's definitely time to take your ball and go home and do something else with your life because it cannot be guaranteed at all. And I think this is one of the most profound things there is to say about this sort of human adventure of, of science, period, which is that everyone who works in uh, fundamental science has the sense that we're exploring something that's out there and something that's much, much larger than each one of us individually. So there's this gigantic structure out there in the uh, universe. It knows vastly more about the laws of nature than we do. It is nature. <laughs> By studying it, we put ourselves in the neighborhood of something that's vastly more powerful, vastly deeper than any of us are individually. The only method that we know of to have access to this tremendous power and depth far beyond what any of us have individually is to interact with it. And I think that's the, the ultimate source of real magic that goes well beyond what humans are capable of now is out there in the structure of the universe. And we only can find what it is by interacting with it and studying it.